welcome. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Um, I will be talking about um, interpreting polynomial structure analytically, um, mainly in an attempt to pass from a model setting um, fp to the n to a more technically challenging setting in zn. And what I'll be talking about is joint work with uh, Tim Gowers. And of course, um, uh, we'll be talking about the uniformity norms. I'll just, uh, I expect most people here to be familiar with them, but I'll put up the definition again, um, just to remind you. Uh, essentially, the kth uniformity norm is an average over um, a k-dimensional cube. Um, and you can define it on any finite abelian group G. Um, I'm only looking at real valued functions here, but there is no um, real restriction. I would have to put some complex conjugate signs on here if I allowed complex valued functions. Um, and in particular for k equals two, you recover um, the following expression. You're taking averages over all so-called additive quadruples um, in F. And if you expand them, using the traditional discrete Fourier transform, what you end up uh, getting is actually just the L4 norm of the Fourier transform. So you see that the um, U2 norm corresponds to the level of traditional Fourier analysis. Well, this last expression should be familiar to anyone uh, doing linearity testing. Or linearity testing, yes, that's exactly right. Um, So the way we exploit this definition is that we say a subset A of this abelian group is uniform if the balanced function um, f sub A um, has small u2 norm. Um, the balanced function is just uh, the indicator function of the set shifted by alpha so that uh, it averages to zero, which is just a technical convenience, really. So Really what we're saying is that A is uniform if it contains the expected number of so-called additive quadruples, the expected number being um, the number expected in the random case. Uh, and by the, sorry, by the um, expression I showed you earlier in terms of the Fourier transform, that's equivalent to saying that the, the largest non-trivial Fourier coefficient is, is small. So when you write this expression, you mean solutions to this equation where all elements are in A? Yes, exactly where x, y, z, and w are in A. Okay, um, and why is this a useful concept? Because it turns out that um, if A is a subset of a group G, then it actually, and it's uniform, then it actually contains the expected number of uh, an arithmetic structure, such as a three-term progression. Um, and you can see that in various ways. Um, one way of seeing that is by counting the um, arithmetic regressions in A uh, using the indicator functions, uh, taking averages over all X and D. And you can expand each of the indicator functions in terms of the Fourier transform. To you do some exponential sums and you end up with um, this uh, sum over Fourier coefficients. And if you isolate the trivial Fourier coefficient, which is always equal to the density of your set um, with the way that I've normalized things, uh, and if you assume that the set is uniform, that means all the non-trivial Fourier coefficients are small, um, you actually get precisely alpha cubed plus uh, you know, some, something that is small. Um, and alpha cubed would be the um, number of uh, three-term progressions you'd expect in if you were choosing your set A independently at random with probability alpha from the group G. So if we set out to um, establish the existence of something like an arithmetic progression of length three, then if we can say that the subset A is uniform, meaning it's kind of random-like, then we actually have lots of three-term progressions and, and we're fine. Uh, so the other case is, um, what can we say if A is not uniform? Um, then by definition, that means there has to be a large Fourier coefficient. Um, and by definition of a Fourier coefficient, that means that the indicator function correlates with a linear phase. So in particular, the groups that I'm thinking about here, say, um, you know, G is equal to um, Z mod NZ with N a prime, 
then my character would be of the form e to the 2 pi i x t um, over n. So that's the character um, t. Or if I look at this other setting that I tend to be interested in, which is fp to the n, then it would be take the form e to the 2 pi i x dot t over p. And I will say, I will make the distinction between the two different groups um, clearer as we go along, because I have different things to say about them. Um, and for the time being, we'll just stick with, with G. So here is a dichotomy. So if your set is uniform, then you can count the three term progressions. If it's not uniform, you have a large Fourier coefficient. You correlate with the linear phase um, that we can summarize in a very traditional um, Fourier decomposition. You I expand f in terms of its Fourier coefficients. And I can split them into two sets, one where the Fourier coefficients are large and one where the Fourier coefficients are small, <coughs> according to this frequency set k here. And what we see in this decomposition that we have one part f1, which is this first sum here, which has some linear structure, because I'm only using very few um, Fourier coefficients. By Parseval's identity, there can't be too many large ones. Um, and f2, the second part here, is clearly uniform because I only put the small Fourier coefficients in there. Um, so I have a decomposition of f into a structured and a uh, random looking part. It is probably f familiar to many people in this room that you cannot um, do the same thing for four term progressions. Um, not just because you cannot express the number of four term progressions in a set A nicely in terms of the Fourier transform, but because there is an actual example that tells you uh, that Fourier analysis is really not sufficient, or at least the way we use Fourier analysis is not sufficient. For example, I can give you a subset of a group, say, I'm going to be very concrete here, fp to the n, which is uniform, but it actually contains many more than the expected number of four term progressions. Um, so this rules out uh, sort of an approach to counting progressions that we've um, pursued for the three-term progressions. Um, an example of this set is very easy to write down. So we just look at all x and fp to the n, such that x transpose x or x dot x is equal to 0. Um, why is this set uniform? Well, it's something to do with um, exponential sums over quadratics being small. Um, so you can, you can calculate it completely explicitly in fp to the n. It's very easy. Um, you can actually write down the indicator function of the set and, and just do the exponential sum. They are as small as possible. There is small. They're, they're, you get square root cancellation here. So th this is really, they're really small. Because um, they're Gauss sums. Because they're Gauss sums, yes. I'll talk more about Gauss sums in a bit. Um, why do they contain too many four term progressions? Um, basically, because of this identity here. Um, it's essentially x squared minus 3x plus d squared plus 3x plus 2d squared minus x plus 3d all squared is equal to 0, and that holds for all x and d. And why does that tell me that there are too many um, four-term progressions in this set, or many more than the expected number? So imagine I could choose, um, I choose x, x plus d, and x plus 2d, um, and I, I know that they're in my set A, that means that the squares of these um, linear forms are equal to 0. So my first three terms are equal to 0. And the last term is a small linear combination of the previous three terms. So in particular, it is forced to be 0 as soon as the first three elements uh, lie in your set A. You automatically get the fourth point of your arithmetic progression also lying in your set A. And if you choose each element, you know, if it were random, you would be getting something of the form alpha to the 4. Here, you only get something of the form alpha cubed, where alpha is the density of the set. Um, so this tells you um, sort of, you know, variants of this example have been around in ergodic theory for a long time. This, was, this one was rediscovered by Tim Gowers in his work on Sem Radius theorem. It tells you that you cannot hope to use an ordinary Fourier approach to counting four-term progressions. So instead, we will use these uniformity norms that I um, uh, told you about on the first slide. And in particular, we will use, um, for four-term progressions, we will use this U3 norm. Um, and we'll say that the set is quadratically uniform if the balance function is small in U3. So this is one level up from the uniformity that I told you about at the beginning. 
the classical Fourier analytic case. And what's so good about a set being quadratically uniform? Well, it turns out that if your set is quadratically uniform, then you actually guarantee the expected number of four-term progressions in that set. Um, in particular, there's this proposition by Tim Gowers, um, which works on any group G, really. Um, if you write down the four AP count in terms of the balance function, you can um, bound that above by this U3 norm. And the proof of this just proceeds via um, cauchy schwarz So really, it's a conceptually very easy proof once you set up your uniformity norms. Um, there is not, there's nothing deep here. That's what these norms were designed to do, control the count over these progressions. It's a little tricky to actually write out, and I'm not going to do it. Um, <coughs> but it's essentially six lines of manipulation, and you have to reparameterize, but there's nothing deep going on here. So this was one part of the dichotomy that we um, saw for the three-term progressions as well. So if, if you're uniform, in this case quadratically uniform, then you get the expected number of um, four-term progressions. Um, quadratically uniform meant you're small in the U3 norm. So what can we say about the number of four-term progressions in a set if you have large U3 norm? Um, and that's a question that was addressed by um, Gowers first and um, in the end, um, made very formal by Green and Tao. What would be a reasonable conjecture? So we saw in the in the um, case of three-term progressions that if you had a if you had large U two norm, then you correlated with a uh, linear phase. So if you have large U three norm, um, you might suspect that you correlate with a quadratic phase, especially after you observe that actually quadratic phases have maximal U3 norm themselves. So you can do the computation and com evaluate the U3 norm of a quadratic phase that will always be equal to one. So this is what we call an inverse theorem um, in FP to the N. And yes, yeah, so here I'm going to specialize a little bit for about five seconds and I'll go back to talking generally. Um, so in the model setting of FP to the N, this statement is indeed true. Maybe I should say a few words about why FP to the N is a model setting for us. Um, the prime P here is to be thought of as small and fixed. So when I'm looking at three-term progressions, I might as well look at F3 to the N. When I look at four-term progressions, I have to take P at least five to make sense of the structure that I have. Um, and N here, the dimension of the vector space, is the quantity that goes to infinity. Um, so we're really thinking of a very, very large dimensional vector space here. Uh, and why is this such a great um, group to study? It's, it's a great group to study because you have a lot of algebraic substructure. You have subspaces. Everything is very exact. You can compute any exponential sum pretty much um, you know, exactly without any error terms. Um, <coughs> that's why we like FP to the n. Um, and you can rephrase many of the problems that you would ask in the integers about arithmetic structures or that you would ask in Z mod NZ about these structures in, in, in FP to the N. And most of the ideas of the proofs um, carry over. Um, and of course, computer scientists have their own interest in, in FP to the N, or in fact, in particularly in F2 to the N. So I'll say a few things about that. Um, actually, I'll say that I don't have much to say about F2 to the N mainly, <laughs> but we'll get to that in a moment. Okay, so what does this inverse theorem look like? It literally says precisely what um, you would suspect. Um, if you have a bounded function that has large U3 norm, then indeed it correlates with a quadratic phase, which I've here expressed in terms of a um, symmetric matrix plus a linear term. And the correlation is a function of the largeness of the U3 norm that you had at the start. So. Um, a very important open question is whether you can actually improve this correlation. So in this um, version that I've stated here, um, the correlation is exponential in delta, um, which is a bit too small. We hope to get something polynomial. Um, but I'll show you a few tricks um, for getting some kind of polynomial correlation out of this in a little bit. Um, and I should say that this was proved 
by Green and Tau for P greater than 2 and summer of Nitsky for P equals 2. Um, there is a certain part of the um, proof of this that you cannot do in characteristic 2, namely the symmetry argument. At some point you end up in Green and Tau's proof um, multiplying by 2 and that's uh, in F2 not such a uh, great thing. Um, So in Z mod NZ, the situation isn't quite so straightforward because it turns out it's actually not true that when you have large U3 norm, then you correlate with a quadratic phase on the whole um, group. Um, that's false. So the best you can hope for is a um, local correlation with a quadratic phase. By local, I mean on a ball set. Um, so the statement would be something like this. So if you have large U3 norm, then there exists a translate of a ball set um, B of width at least something that is polynomial in delta and I mentioned at most something that is also polynomial in delta together with um, a quadratic function which is defined on that translate of the ball set such that you know locally on that translate of a ball set you correlate with this quadratic and in that case actually this correlation will turn out to be quadratic uh, polynomial uh, instead of exponential but the problem is that this quadratic phase on this ball set doesn't extend to the whole space. Um, you can easily write down some quadratics for which this is just, you cannot extend them to the whole space. Um, so maybe some people that don't know what the ball was set that I will, uh, should I write it? it? it you will, if you don't I, I will talk about ball sets in the last part, uh, but let me write down what, a def what we mean by that. Well, let me say what we mean by it first. So a ball set is a, an approximate level set of a bunch of characters. Uh, joint level set. So in particular, if I have a set of frequencies um, k, then I can define a ball set, um, which we actually don't have a word for what k is with respect to it. I call it the heart of the ball set, but I get laughed it's at for that. Of right, it's a collection of characters um, and a width row, which means that this contains all x in my group um, such that you know, say if I'm in yeah, Zn, let me make this clear, such that x um, times t divided by p is at most rho um, and this is for all t in k. Okay. Um, by this I mean that the fractional part of this is, is less than rho. Um, It's, it, it's, uh, yes, it's, a, it's, a, it's roughly, it looks like a multidimensional arithmetic progression. You can find multidimensional arithmetic progression inside the ball set and you can put the ball set inside an arithmetic. It's, they're, they're more or less equivalent. Um, and you want to make sure that all your characters roughly map um, the points in the ball set to. What is the P? P is N. P is N. Oh, sorry, P is N. Yes, thank you. In FP to the end, this is exactly a subspace. Um, and I, I will tell you more about the precise analogy between the, the subspaces and the ball sets later. Um, just wanted to actually state the inverse theorem. Okay, the proof of this is pretty um, deep and um, yeah, I, I will, won't say any more about that and long. So. In the quadratic case now we've seen, you know, we have, if the set is quadratically uniform, I can count the four term progressions. If it's not quadratically uniform, I have this inverse theorem that tells me that I, my um, function correlates with this quadratic. Again, I would like to be able to summarize this dichotomy in some kind of decomposition. Um, so in particular here, we're aiming for a decomposition of the form f equals f1 plus f2, where I want this um, f1 part to be quadratically structured in some sense. Um, and somehow have bounded complexity, meaning not have too many um, components in it. Um, and I want F2 to be um, quadratically uniform. In this case, we mean by that, I mean pretty precisely that it's small in U3. Um, and this, this would be a kind of quadratic Fourier expansion if we actually had a basis for the um, space of quadratics. 
um, that would, you know, in, in, in the Fourier case, in the linear case, it's very easy to write down the expansion because you have a basis of, in terms of these linear characters that you find um, coefficients for. So you can expand the bounded function in terms of these characters. For the quadratic phases, there is no orthonormal basis so you have to find another way of actually finding the coefficients for each of these quadratic phases. And the way, um, there are various ways of doing this. Um, last time I spoke here about this, I talked about a decomposition by Green and Tao, which was, um, which borrowed language from ergodic theory. It talked about factors and projections onto factors. Um, but it was quantitatively rather weak. I mean, it did the job for the result that we wanted to prove, but. It was quantitatively rather weak, so this time, um, well, we went ahead and actually proved our own decomposition, and I'm only going to state a very simplified version for the time being. Um, so here we're saying that if you know f is a bounded function, I can decompose it into um, a sum of quadratic phases plus um, a function g plus a function h, where um, these qi's are quadratic forms, um, G is indeed my quadratically uniform part. Um, and this function H is uh, small in L1. This will always be negligible, so you can always think of H as actually not, not being there. Um, I don't see H when I look at this. I just have this blind spot somewhere. Um, so there is some paper from extractor say uh, the from the, yeah, the, this is a philosophy you know small yeah. small Yes, yeah, so this will always work. Okay, great. I should read some papers on extractors. <laughs> um, and we said, so we wanted to have this quadratically structured part here, and we wanted that to have not too high complexity, and that is expressed in this case just in the way that um, the sum of the absolute value of these coefficients lambda i is, uh, is not too big. Um, that's not necessarily saying that there aren't a lot of quadratic phases in that um, quadratically structured part, um, and that's actually a problem. Um, we're just saying that they d the L1 weight of this uh, of these um, quadratic forms isn't too big. This is because we don't have a passive value. So. Right, we don't yet have a sort of passive value type identity. No, we, we, ha we, we have an idea of what it should be, but it's... So if you just stick in the inverse theorem, you know, and get take the ex exponential correlation that you get from the inverse theorem to prove this um, decomposition theorem, you actually get um, that the L1 weight here is, is exponential in delta, which, again, is not so great for a lot of applications. OK. Um, if you wanted to um, write down a corresponding version for the group Z mod NZ, I already said it's a little more complicated because uh, you only get this local correlation on a Bohr set. So what you would have to do is insert a, a, a characteristic function for a um, translate of a Bohr set in front of each of these quadratic phases. You'd have to give each Bohr set a dimension and a width. Um, but other than that, this would look uh, very similar. Uh, and the proof actually is um, identical. So the way we prove this is using the hahn banach theorem from uh, functional analysis. Call it the duality, the duality of, of linear problem structure. Mm. Sorry, I stole your line, yes. No, 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 go, go ahead. Would you like to? <laughs> um, yes, it appears in many different guises. And I have to admit that when I, uh, when Tim first told me that he thought we could use Han Banach, I thought, oh my god, Han Banach, that's something I learned a long time ago. And I've never actually put it to any use. So this is a. Um, a very nice, uh, a very clean application. Um, and I will state a corollary of Han Banach that we use in a, in a, in a moment. So it basically says if you have a normed space and a um, vector in it that has norm greater than one, then you can find a hyperplane that separates x from all the vectors that have norm less than y. Um, and in the particular way that we're using this, we, we're replacing the energy increment argument in this um, green and tau decomposition that I alluded to earlier, uh, which is good. It's more, more efficient. 
It actually allows you to decompose functions that are bounded in L2, just in L2, not in L infinity. Not that that's actually made a huge difference so far in our applications, but you know, it's a weaker assumption that we're putting on the function, so that's kind of good. And um, yeah, Tim has also used this to prove a new version of the Green Tower transference principle, which was used in the proof that there are arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions in the primes. So it, it's, it's a very powerful tool. Um, the corollary that we use um, is a, it really is very easy to deduce from what I stated earlier. So if you um, decompose um, your vector space of dimension n over the complex numbers into sort of k parts, say, um, so you. How is Uh, it, this is a general, the most general version you can write down. It will do everything for you for the reason that I will tell you what these VIs are later and you will see that I can stick any so this slide field into. This is totally okay. self-contained, yeah. You don't need to. Um, and suppose it's not possible to write we would like to right. decompose. Start, start again. So okay. you have just said decompose, arbitrary decompose. Position C, uh, to, the C to the N into these K subspaces. Each carries its own norm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we would like, really what we, we want to decompose a vector in this space, okay? Um, and we're gonna argue by contradiction. Suppose that it's not possible to write the vector as a linear sum X1 plus dot 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 plus XK where each of the xi's lies in the subspace vi. Um, and suppose also that if you take some coefficients alpha 1 um, to, through alpha k, then the uh, sum of the norms weighted by these coefficients is at most 1. Then what Han Banach tells you is that there exists a vector um, z such that the inner product of x with z is at least 1. Yeah, you can see to the end. Yes, typo, thank you. And such that um, the inner product of y with any, uh, no, the, the inner product of z with any y um, for y in vi is at most this coefficient alpha that you assume was sort of not true. Uh, and each of these y's has to have norm less than one in its particular space that it lives in. And, and that last condition can just be rephrased in terms of the dual norm of the, um, of z, so it tells you that this vector z that you have, whose existence you've established by using Han Banach, um, has dual norm at most alpha i for each i. Okay. Um, so when we apply this, what kind of decomposition were we looking for? Um, we want to decompose f as a sum of, well, first of all, some quadratic phases. Um, and then I have this G, which has small u3 norm, and I have an H, which has small l1 norm. So what we will take is we'll take um, a lot of these um, subspaces just generated by, you take every possible quadratic phase, every possible um, omega to the Q, and you take the subspace that is generated by it, just, you know, with any scalar um, multiple of it. Uh, and the norm on that subspace will just be the absolute value of that uh, uh, lambda. So that, um, yeah, so you take that subspace for every quadratic phase. Then you need a subspace that um, has the U3 norm on it. And you need a last subspace that has the L1 norm on it. Okay. Well, you just take, you take the whole space. You take the whole space, yeah. Um, to prove this, you just define the norm on the entire space as the minimum of this expression, overall decomposition of x. So you don't have to define the norm on the whole space. You don't have to define a norm. We're just doing it piece by piece. But what comes out is that there exists a single vector z, such that each of these dual norms is, is small. Um, Okay, so in particular, what does this mean? Let's see. So if I cannot write f as, hold on, as um, the sum of the quadratic phases plus g plus h, 
with all these um, conditions, then Han Banach tells me that there exists a function phi, my vector z earlier, such that um, f has uh, inner product at least one with phi. That was my first um, uh, consequence of Han Banach. And then on each of the subspaces, the dual norm um, of z was small. So what are the dual norms that we have here? We had an L1 norm of one of the spaces. The dual norm of that is L infinity. That tells me that the um, phi, um, the infinity is it's bounded in L infinity. Then we had uh, the U3 norm. The dual norm of that was um, U3 uh, star, obviously, just, just by definition. Um, that's also bounded in terms of delta. And then um, we had all these subspaces generated by the omega q's. And here we just take the direct, we're not writing down the dual norm. We're just saying that the inner product of phi with any of these quadratic phases is at most m, because we were assuming that um, m inverse, rather. Okay. Then you get that for every quadratic form. Now, why is that a good thing? Because um, first of all, by Cauchy-Schwarz, um, the fact that the inner product of f with phi is at, mo at least 1 tells you that um, the, the L2 norm of phi is at least 1. You just you know, bound it on the left here. Um, and use the fact that the L2 norm of f is at most 1. But then that tells you that the inner product of phi with phi, which we just said is at least 1, you can bound that above by the U3 norm of phi times the U3 dual norm of um, phi. And that tells you um, that phi has to have large U3 norm, because here we saw that the U3 star norm was bounded. OK, we're almost there. So now we have a function that has large U3 norm. And fortunately, out of um, the assumption, or the assumption for contradiction that we have, we also know that phi is bounded in L infinity. So we can apply the U3 inverse theorem to the function phi. Notice we're not applying it to the function f. We're applying it to the function phi that Han Banach gave us. Um, well, we have to rescale it slightly by a factor of delta, but that doesn't make any difference at all. Um, and indeed, by the U3 inverse theorem, we find that there is a quadratic form Q such that um, phi correlates with it, um, correlates with it exponentially. Okay. Um, and so, um, but we also knew that the correlation of phi with any quadratic form was at most m inverse. And so we can um, set m equal to this exponential for this to work. Um, OK, so this is a very efficient way to extract a decomposition theorem from um, an inverse theorem. So Tim has a nice article. I think it's in the bulletin of the AMS. Where Do you know where it is? Anyway, on how to do this in, in complete generality, essentially. This works not just for FP to the end. Um, you can, you can, any inverse theorem of this type that you have will give you a decomposition theorem by this method. Um, OK, um, I want to spend about 10 minutes talking about <coughs> why we're actually interested in these decomposition theorems, what our number theoretic applications um, were. And then I want to go back to. Um, describing some more advanced decomposition theorems that really give you much stronger results. Um, remember right now, literally all we had was, you know, we had some quadratic phases plus a uh, thing that was small in U3 plus a thing that was small in L1. And that by itself doesn't actually do everything you want it to do. So let me um, briefly talk about the number theoretic applications to give you some motivation here. Um, Green and Tao wrote a paper on linear equations in primes in 2006. That's already quite a while back now. Um, which at its heart had, um, well, I guess Semmerides' theorem as a black box. And all the um, uniformity norm technology that went into Semmerides' theorem is there. In particular, they needed to control um, the number of solutions to arbitrary linear systems in the primes um, by one of these uniformity norms. So the question was, you know, if you give me a linear system, by what uniformity norm can I control it? And they came up with this um, notion of uh, 
well, they don't call it Cauchy-Schwarz complexity. That was, uh, um, but we do. Um, this notion of Cauchy-Schwarz complexity, which roughly speaking, you know, there's a more rigorous and wordy definition. Roughly speaking, says that um, if you have a system of m-linear forms, then it has Cauchy-Schwarz complexity k if, after an appropriate reparameterization of your linear forms, there exists a set of k plus one variables that are only simultaneously used by one of your forms. So let me give you an example of that. Um, you already gave us two examples, just a three-term arithmetic. Progression. progression. Four term. Four term, but it, yeah, so this is what I was just going to write down. It's actually not obvious with a four-term arithmetic progression that there exists such a set of variables, right? Because um, if you write down what you would usually write down, which is For your um, arithmetic progression, you would choose x, x plus d, x plus 2d, x plus 3d, most likely, unless you're um, <coughs> a bit strange. Uh, so, so that does not fulfill this condition. There is no set of k plus 1. Uh, there is no set of, um, like, say, three variables that are simultaneously only used by one of the forms. Okay. Uh, but you can reparameterize the four-term progressions as follow, you can actually as follows, you can actually write them as y plus two z plus three w, and then you subtract x um, y x plus y plus z plus w at each stage, and you actually that's your common difference. So you notice as I'm going from the first term to the second term to the third to the fourth, you're sort of just subtracting x plus y plus z plus w, and this indeed um, actually for every um, triple of variables, it is true that it's only used by one of the linear forms. So the first one is only used by the first one, triple y, z, w, is only used by the first one, et cetera, right? And so it turns out that that's exactly the condition that allows you to use just the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality to bound the average over your linear system above by the u3 norm in this case, OK? That's exactly the kind of general condition you want to be make this Cauchy-Schwarz proof um, work. And it's not hard to see that you know this Cauchy-Schwarz complexity of a k-term progression is k minus two, and indeed by you know a generalization of the example I showed you for the four-term progression, this is really the right norm to be looking at for arithmetic progressions. And you can look at as a d-dimensional cube. Again, the Cauchy-Schwarz complexity is d minus one. Again, that makes sense actually because these d-dimensional cubes were used to define the UK norms, so you wouldn't expect anything else to come out here. Um, x plus, so for the three-dimensional x plus x, x plus a, x plus b, x plus c, x plus all the pairs, x plus all the triples, and then x plus a plus b. Yeah, x plus a plus b plus c. Just what you use to write down the uniformity norm. Or you want... How many equations are there? So there are two to the d variable in this, in this system of equations, or the mm. So there are d plus one oh, um, yeah, variables, the, the points that define the right. thing, yes. Right. And uh, don't challenge me to actually write down the no. parameterization that shows you that this is true. Yeah, it's actually, I think it's easy. OK. So what you get out um, of this definition, I mean, that's what the definition was designed to do, is you get that if you have a linear system of this Cauchy-Schwarz complexity k, then you can control it by the UK plus one norm using the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality only. And then our question was, you know, what's the minimal um, K such that this UK norm actually controls this average? You know, is this Cauchy-Schwarz complexity really the best that you can do? Does that actually give you the right K? Because remember, like, Fourier analysis first was easy. The U2 norm was easy to deal with, at least in our finite settings, right? I'm sure there are. There's hard Fourier analysis too, but for us, the, the U2 setting is easy. The U3 setting is a lot harder, and everything above that is still so undeveloped that you know, the higher your K gets, the worse you're off because you can't actually do anything with it. So it's a really, um, it would be really useful to make that K as small as it could possibly be. Um, And to make this a little more rigorous, we sort of define the true complexity of a set really as the sort of smallest k that you can put on the um, right-hand side that it controls the average in a sort of slightly analytic way. There is a dependence here of delta on epsilon. But other than that, it's the same 
you know, we don't expect it to be controlled by the UK norm itself, but it's like by some function of the UK norm, essentially. Um, so we call that a true complexity of the system. And just by definition, the true complexity is always about bounded above by the cauchy schwarz complexity because you know, if something has cauchy schwarz complexity K, then we know we can control it by the UK norm. The question is just, can we do better? And it turns out that, yes, in general, the two types of complexity are not equal. And in particular, you can write down systems that have cauchy schwarz complexity too according to Green and Tail, but that actually only, that are actually controlled by the U2 norm and not by the U3 norm. And for some systems, that's a useful um, thing to know. So I'll give you an example of such a system. This one has six linear forms and three variables. Um, and here is another one. This one is a sort of a little more systematic. The first one was just random experimentation. This one, you can see that the coefficients of um, y increase linearly and the coefficient of z increase quadratically, except for the last um, coefficient, which is not a typo. Um, it's there on purpose and it makes the thing work. So what am I saying about these examples? I'm saying that um, if you try to do the cauchy schwarz argument on them, you would get that they're controlled by the U3 norm, but because, um, uh, but we actually know that we can control them by the U2 norm. So in what sense do these systems differ from the four-term progressions? Um, because we know that for four-term progressions, we couldn't possibly use the U2 norm. Well, what would recall this example that I gave you earlier? What, what, was, what made it impossible for the four-term progression count to be controlled by the U2 norm? It was the fact that there was a linear dependence between the squares of these linear forms. And um, as a result of this, we conjectured that actually, um, you know, you can control something by the U2 norm whenever, if and only if the functions of uh, Li squared are linearly independent, meaning if and only if the squares of your linear forms that define your system are linearly independent. So one direction here is easy. So if they are dependent, then clearly you can't control it by the U2 norm because of precisely an example of this type. You can extend this to any um, system of linear forms that has a square dependence. But the other direction is more complicated. So what if the squares of the linear forms are actually independent? And uh, can you show that um, that means that you can actually control the average by the U2 norm? Actually, the, the conjecture we made was more general. This was something we had already proved by the time we publicized this. Um, namely, that you know the true complexity, the smallest k that you can control the average by is actually the smallest k such that the k plus 1 powers of the linear forms are linearly independent, which gives you a nice um, necessary and sufficient condition. So when you look at a system, you just check what powers of the linear forms are linearly independent. Yeah, you have to do all powers up to k plus 1. Yes, so you have to check uh, until you hit a power that is independent, yes. Um, I'm actually still interested to see if there is this. Does anyone know of a way of... Um, doing that efficiently? Is there any way, other than just you know, trying them out one by one, is there any way that if you just look at a system of linear forms or a system of linear equations, can you tell, is there anything that tells you immediately which, which power of the linear forms will be linearly independent? Maybe there's an algorithm for that. I don't know. Um, OK, so um, in 2007, when I last talked about this here, uh, we had proved this case, uh, this, this conjecture in a very special case, namely only in FP to the n, and under the special um, restriction that the cauchy schwarz complexity of the system was at most 2. So we really could only look at a very small um, kind of subset of the whole conjecture, um, mainly because at the time we didn't have an inverse conjecture for the higher, an inverse theorem for the higher UK norms. Um, and indeed, it is true that, you know, you can control something by the U2 norm if and only if the squares of the linear forms are linearly independent. Um, and the idea of the proof is the following, and this is where the decompositions come in. You decompose you know, your function uh, or the balance function of your set into a quadratically structured and a quadratically uniform part. And by the cauchy schwarz argument and the definition of cauchy schwarz complexity, this quadratically uniform part will disappear. 
um, will be negligible. And all you're left with is a product over these structured parts. And these structured parts are quadratically structured. Um, so you can explicitly compute what happens to the images of the linear forms under these quadratic phases. And because the squares of the forms are linearly independent, you actually find that you, know, you have a good deal of equidistribution on, um, on the residue classes. And that means uh, that your average is indeed going to be um, small and controlled by this norm. OK. Uh, more recently, we have done this for Z mod NZ. I've already said that it's a lot more complicated because you have to do all these ball set things. And the paper is, uh, I think, 68 pages long by now. And it's very technical. Um, So I want to avoid talking about that as much as possible. Um, what I would like to uh, talk about is how to actually get good um, decompositions in FP to the end that are really strong in a quantitative sense and also as general as uh, possible at this point in time. These are two different directions I'll be taking. Um, I'll first talk about strong quadratic decompositions on FP to the end, not for very long. but. And then I'll talk about what sort of more general decompositions you can find on FP to the N. Um, in fact, the most general ones that are around at the moment. OK. Um, for a decomposition to be really useful in applications, you know, even if you just think of this simple sum that I wrote down earlier you know, of quadratic phases plus a part that is small in U3 plus um, a part that is small in U1. Um, we're going to do a number of things. We're going to take advantage of actually some stronger information that the inverse theorem provides. Um, not because what Green and Tao really proved when they proved their inverse theorem wasn't just that you can, you get uh, a correlation with a quadratic phase on the whole space, um, an exponential correlation with a quadratic phase on the whole space. You actually get um, a kind of parallel quadratic correlation of translates of, of a subspace that only has polynomial co-dimension. And a similar thing is true for um, Zn when you replace the space, subspace by the Bohr set. Actually, the slightly funny thing here is that the way that the dimension defi is defined for a Bohr set is actually should be the co-dimension if you replace the um, subspace by the Bohr set. And we talk of dimension for the Bohr set, which should actually be the co-dimension of the thing. But that's. Uh, different matter. Uh, yeah. um, then another thing we're going to do is we're going to cluster those quadratic phases together that only differ by a low rank um, uh, phase because um, those low rank phases, um, yeah, because I want to be as efficient as possible with my quadratic phases. I don't want to have too many around. Like right now, the decomposition I stated earlier, we just have these L, this L1 bound on the, on the coefficients. And we have no way of telling how many there actually are. So if we, this is a sort of reasonably simple graph theory argument, you, you can cluster them together and make sure that you're only using a few of them because if they only differ by a low rank phase from something else, then they're going to look pretty similar. Um, so you just want to be a bit efficient about it. I'm not going to talk about that very much. Uh, and then lastly, um, when we, in our application, we're trying to show that we can control an average by the U2 norm. That means we can actually assume that f, uh, the function f is actually highly linearly uniform, even though we don't know that it's quadratically uniform. And if you think about it, um, and you have something that is really highly linearly uniform, then it shouldn't have any low rank quadratic phases in its decomposition, because the low rank quadratic phases are very effectively very linear. Um, in their appearance, and they, that doesn't mesh well with the um, linear uniformity that you're assuming in F. So if you assume that F is actually highly linearly uniform, you can get a decomposition that only has high rank quadratic phases in it, which is really good for doing your exponential sums, your Gauss sums in general. You want those phases to be high rank. Um, so I just have a bit more information about um, what this um, parallel version of the inverse theorem is that I was talking about. So 
what Green and Tao actually proved is that there exists a subspace of polynomial codimension such that for each translate, there is a quadratic phase um, and with the property that um, actually the average over all these um, translates um, is also polynomial. Um, that's uh, fp to the end of okay. This is fp to yeah, the so end. that's also in some odd mistakes. Uh, yeah, so it's also proof of fp to the end. It's the same. Okay. I, I the sum of mystery proof it does the same thing if you put okay. the codiment and just have the same statement true and f to the end. And moreover though the, the really important thing here is is not just that you know you can find a quadratic phase on each subspace, because that's obviously gonna be true. Um, you can find essentially just one quadratic phase that you shift on each subspace, such that um, you know, and that's only differs by a Freiman homomorphism, which is this phi of y, which may depend on your translate. But effectively, you're using the same quadratic phase on each of the subspaces. I don't think that is in Sam Ronetsky. It's the same proof anyway, so it's... Uh, okay. You can, you can okay. Um, and what that leads us to is, so we define a, something called a quadratic average, which is just... Um, um, I should write it down somewhere. Um, something of this form, you just take the average of over all these um, shifted linear phases, and when you take that and you um, and you stick that information into the inverse theorem, what you actually get out is that f of x correlates with one of these quadratic uh, averages in a polynomial fashion. So this is quite, um, quite useful. But recall that, oh, actually, there's something missing here. Um, der. This is better. I have to do this on each subspace, on each translate of the subspace. OK, so you can use that. Um, so the the subspaces that you use um, have polynomial codimension, which is what we call the complexity of the subspace of the average, and you get this polynomial correlation, and that gets you somewhere. So the new decomposition that we'll be stating will have these um, quadratic averages rather than just a simple quadratic phases in them, and the advantage here will be that um, you know, everything else stays the same, but now um, this bound m on the size of the coefficients is actually polynomial in delta. Um, of course, you're going to have to work a bit harder to make you know, all your computations work with these quadratic averages, but it does save us one exponential in the end. Um, so we go from a yeah, triple to a double exponential. Let me just say a few words about um, rank which I shouldn't have to at this point because the rank of a quadratic phase is a very uh, well-studied um, concept. Um, you can, especially over fp to the end, you just look at the rank of the matrix that defines your quadratic form. Um, but it's very important to know what the rank of a quadratic form is in your decomposition because we need to evaluate all these, these Gauss sums. Um, and the higher the rank, the smaller the sum. And because we want to show that an average in the end is small, we really would like all of our quadratic phases to have pretty high rank. <coughs> And I'll just remark that low rank means that your constant of on affine subspaces of small codimension. The same kind of idea when so recently to uh, type calculation of the distribution of weights in Reed Miller code, which are just all degree polynomials. When you uh -huh. start to worry about the rank of this, uh, uh, well, let's say the quadratic case of the quadratic polynomials, then you can uh, really see that they contribute high weights. Right. But, but most of the uh, weights will be uh, very, very uh, yeah, close to the center. I mean, it will be high okay. weight code except for what's contributed. But okay. This is the Paris Cisco Palam. That's quite a few other types. Oh, yeah, you should. Um, and I'm mainly mentioning this because I want to. Um, uh huh. It's not moving anymore. No, it is. 
Okay, move on to the higher degree uniformity now. So until very recently, uh, we did not have an inverse theorem for these higher UK norms, meaning that you know the conjecture was reasonably obvious. You know, if you if you have large UK norm, then you ought to correlate with a polynomial phase of degree k minus one. But even in this, the model setting of fp to the n, this was not proved until recently. And as far as I'm, I'm yeah, I'm being videoed, so I'm not going to say this now. But this is a bit of a cheat. I mean, it's proved, right? It's a great theorem. Um, but it's they use ergodic theory and then they pull it back into fp to the n, which, um, given that it's such a combinatorial statement, I really think it needs a combinatorial proof. So that's something I'm thinking about at the moment. Um, notice that in this general um, uh, theorem, where we're really saying that if you have large UK plus one norm, then you correlate with a polynomial phase of degree K, there is a restriction on um, K in terms of the characteristic of the field. So you need the characteristic to be sufficiently large. Um, it has to be at least K, because it had actually been disproved for pay, P less than K by um, Greentow and Lovett, Meshon, and Samaritnitsky in 2008. Um, sort of being a bit vague here, unresolved issues persist in the case of small characteristic. Um, this is, of, of course, of particular importance to um, computer scientists. But there is, even though it hasn't been proven, uh, to my knowledge anyway, um, this conjecture with um, P less than K. And in this particular form, it's not even true. Um, but there is a very good um, conjecture as to what the right answer ought to be. So here the problem is that we're really already assuming that we're taking um, pth root of unity here um, in our polynomial phase function. So we're really only taking, when we're defining a polynomial, we're only taking derivatives in the exponent already. I mean, we're taking additive derivatives in the exponent as opposed ta to taking multiplicative derivatives of the entire um, um, phase function. Because if you change the definition of what a phase polynomial is to, you know, taking multiplicative derivatives and requiring them to be zero, and you look at, you know, polynomials that actually map into T, then it transpires that you cannot restrict your attention to just P roots of unity, but you actually have to take um, P to the K roots of unity. Um, actually, different type of P to the K, but two to the K roots of unity. So that should be, you should be able to get um, in F2 to the N, a uh, correlation of f with uh, s a polynomial um, that will be divided by 2 to the k rather than just 2. Um, so there is a sensible um, interpretation of what you know, should replace this initially slightly misguided conjecture. Um, in this um, theorem, the bounds are not explicit because um, they pull things back from ergodic theory. Um, Terry tells me even if he were to make them explicit, which I think he has no intention of doing, um, they would be very, very bad. Um, and finally, as I said, there's no combinatorial analytic proof of this currently. Um, the fact that the bounds are so bad influenced our attitudes somewhat when it came to proving a decomposition to go with these um, higher order inverse theorems. Because if you don't have a good quantitative information to start with, you, you know, sort of less motivated to actually um, prove a strong quantitative <laughs> decomposition for it. Um, so we're going to just make that naive attempt at decomposing a function f in sort of high degree polynomial phases. Um, here we want g to be small in uk plus 1. And you know, we can get. Um, this polynomial to be of degree k just by the hahn banach method. But then the question is, um, can we actually take, usefully take exponential sums over these polynomials? And the way it stands, um, the answer is no, because we have no idea what the rank of a degree k um, phase function is, right? Or a degree k polynomial in this case. Um, so what we will do, oh, and the, sometimes this doesn't work properly. Um, so because we use this high rank condition to evaluate exponential sums in the quadratic case, we thought, why don't we use the requirement that the sum be small as a definition of what high rank actually means? Um, so we're literally just saying that the rank of a degree k polynomial um, is the 
a negative of the logarithm to base p of you know, precisely the exponential sum that we want to take. And that tells you that the rank is large whenever the exponential sum is small. So you get a nice um, relation between the two. Um, Green and Tao had you know, suggested a different interpretation of rank of a polynomial. If you could make it up of a bounded function of lower degree polynomials, that gave it um, relatively low rank. Um, in particular, with regards, to, you know, with a view to sort of transferring these techniques to Z mod NZ, I, I believe that this um, analytic definition is very nice. Um, you have to work a bit harder with some in some aspects because, um, well, first of all, we need to make sure that this analytic definition actually, you know, ties in with our intuition. Um, in particular, the UK norm of a um, degree K polynomial of high rank ought to be small and the UK dual norm of a high rank, of a small um, low rank polynomial of degree k ought to be small. So this should be very anti-uniform and this should be very uniform. So when you say low rank, you mean like tens of rank? So no, I'm not, I'm not, no, I'm just saying. If it could tie with some intuition. We okay, so I'm with the quadratic, with the, with the quadratic um, intuition, for example, if you have a high rank quadratic form, you want, it, it should have, um, small u2 norm. It should be very uniform. Yeah, you can yes. generalize it to higher dimension, just look at multilinear polynomials. Right, so right. The tensor, the tensor rank. rank. Uh, you can yes, it yes. Mm -hmm. So, and you get this very easily from this analytic definition by, um, you just expand it out. And it comes out from you know, the de definition of the UK norm on the polynomial. You want to make sure, sort of very, basic things that you sometimes need. You want to make sure that, you know, that the rank doesn't go down too much when you restrict your attention to a smaller subspace. Uh, and it doesn't go up too much when you, you know, go the opposite way. Um, and one very important property that is very obvious with the rank of a quadratic form is that you want it to be um, sub-additive. So if you have two matrices A and B, then the rank of the sum of these is at most the sum of the ranks of the of A and B. And that's a property we need very frequently um, when we do computations with these quadratic forms. Um, 